Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Allison Buchanan, and I'm a senior associate lawyer in our Toronto office. I practice in the Labor and Employment Group, and uh, I primarily advise our, our clients on a host of workplace issues. I also, um, my practice also includes employment litigation, and I assist clients with the workplace and business-related claims, including wrongful dismissals and human rights. And I'm thrilled to be here today to moderate our Cross-Canada Labor and Employment Law Update. In last month's session, we highlighted the Canadian Employment and Labor Case Law and other leg legislative developments that you may have missed over the summer. Today, we'll be reviewing some key issues our clients from across Canada have been facing in the last few months. Today, I'm joined by my esteemed colleagues from across the country. Ariane Bouchard, a partner in our Montreal office, is the national co-leader of the Employment and Labor Group. In her practice, Ariane advises employers of all sizes on matters pertaining to collective and individual labor relations at both provincial and federal levels. Today, Ariane will be taking, talking to us about the implications of Quebec's Charter of French Language on your workplace. Unfortunately, Jonathan Moore is no longer able to attend today, but we are in excellent hands with Healing Kwan, an associate here in our Toronto office who will be speaking to us about what employers need to know about hiring a temporary worker under the International Mobility Program. Helen is a unique asset to our Labour and Employment Group as she specializes in immigration and has significant experience assisting clients navigating the Canadian immigration landscape. We also have Victoria Merritt, an associate from our Vancouver office. Victoria has diverse experience advising clients on managing all aspects of employment matters. She provides direct practical advice with a focus on risk management and early conflict resolution. When trial is necessary, Victoria is a skilled advocate in the courtroom and has appeared at all levels, including the Supreme Court of Canada. Today, Victoria will give us the latest on new British Columbia pay transparency law. And last but certainly not least is my office neighbor and fellow Torontonian, Larissa Workowicz. Larissa is an associate in our labor and employment group who advises clients on all areas of employment law and has a growing expertise in labor relations. Today, Larissa will be giving us uh, an employee termination update. Specifically, she'll update us on upcoming changes to federal termi termination notice period. Please welcome Ariane Bouchard to kick us off with the implications of Quebec's Charter of French Language on your workplace. Thank you, Alison. So as mentioned, I'm going to present today on the Quebec Charter French Language uh, in the workplace. Um, just to note, if it sounds familiar for some of you, uh, this is a topic on which my colleague Marie-Noëlle Mascotte already presented uh, in the summer of 2022. But we still have a lot and a lot of questions about this topic. So we decided to revisit it today uh, with a bit of new information, but also um, like the, the, the core provisions are applicable to employers. So next slide, please. So um, the, uh, on, on June 1st, 2022, the Act Respecting French, the official and common language of Quebec received the royal assent, so a bit more than a year right now. Uh, it's refer, uh, if you're familiar with the term Bill 96, uh, this is often how we refer to it. Uh, and introduced several am amendments to the Charter of the French Language, uh, some of which impose new obligation on employer and strengthen the right of Quebec workers to carry out their activities in French. Uh, those amendments adopted will gradually come into force until 2025. However, uh, it must be uh, known that uh, most amendments pertaining to the language of work came into force on June 1st, 2022 already, a couple of them on June 2023 as well. So um, most of the what is applicable to employers is already in force. Next slide, please. So just uh, as a general note, and I'm not going to read uh, this provision of um, the Act, the Charter, um, but the general principle is that the Charter uh, gives the right uh, uh, to every workers in the province of Quebec to carry on their activities in French, and it imposed corresponding obligation on the employer uh, to ensure that this right would be respected. Uh, and one note is that uh, 
those obligations apply to all employers, regardless of how many workers they employ in Quebec. So even if you have one or two or three employees in Quebec only, yes, this still applies to you. Next slide, please. So uh, as I was mentioning, there are a couple of corresponding obligations that are imposed to the employer. We're going to go through each of them. So the first one is regarding job posting. So prior to Bill 96, employers were already required to draft and publish offers of employment and promotion in French. Uh, now the obligation also specifically applies to transfers and also to promotion. Uh, as before, the job posting may be published uh, in another language than French, most commonly English. However, it must be known that employer must now ensure that if they do it in both language, uh, it is the, 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 the publication in another language and the one in French are done simultaneously. It cannot be done. The French one can come before, but not after. And the employer should use the same means of transmission and reaching a target audience of comparable size. So for example, it would not be sufficient to say, okay, we will post it on our website in both French and English. And for the English one, we would also promote it on LinkedIn, Glassdoor, like all those websites, but not in French. Like it has to uh, be comparable size. Uh, it must also be known that if the knowledge of a language other than French is required by the nature of the duty related to a position, if you want, for example, the person to speak English to uh, apply on that position, the reason justifying such requirement must be indicating on the job posting directly. Next slide. The second thing that I want to talk about is uh, indi individual employment contracts. So the general principle is that all individual employment contracts in Quebec shall be drafted in French. However, there are exceptions to that. The party may express their wish to have such contract draft in a language other than French. However, how it's going to apply is different if it's a contract of adhesion or a negotiated individual employment contract. A contract of indigen is a part a contract where the party, um, one of the party does not really negotiate the term of the agreement. It's more a take it or leave it agreement. Like it's a job offer, the salary is already decided, the number of vacation, like all the terms of employment are this is our offer. And it's either you accept the position and or or you don't. In such a case, the contract must uh, the, the employer must present the contract in French first or at the same time than the version in another language for the contract signed in another language to be valid. So uh, either in two separate documents or in the same document with two columns, but you, you must keep a record if the person signed the English version that you already present them with the French version as well. Uh, for negotiated and German contract, the party may simply express their wish that if their express wishes to, to have it draft exclusively in another language than French. Uh, and just uh, so you know, um, employee who, who enter in, into an employment agreement in another language than French before June 1st, 2022, add until June of this year to request the translation. So if they haven't asked for it yet, you're out of the wood for that. Next slide, please. So uh, other employment related documents, so for example, um, work like any policies, any uh, employee toolkit, any handbook, uh, and as well as training document uh, must be made available to employee in French. Uh, they may exist in another language, but the French version must be available on terms that are at least as favorable to that other version. Uh, the, the charter was also imposing a delay of one year until June 1st, 2023 to uh, make a French version available. Um, so now technically it's all supposed to be translated. Uh, it's less relevant for employee, but it's good to know insurers are also required to see a copy of a group insurance policy in French to their client and to distribute insurance certificates in French as well to uh, employees in the province of Quebec. And the same applies with respect to the group annuity contract. Again, they had a delay of one year to comply uh, if the, 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 the document issued before June 1st, 2022 were not translated in French. Next slide, please. 
the written communication with employees, another big topic. So prior to Bill 96, written communication addressed by the employer to its staff were already required to be in French. But now they, they, they clarify in the, the new charter that it, this applied to written communication applied to only part of the staff, to a particular employee, or to an association of worker. And this applies both to communication during employment, but also to communication at the time of the termination of employment and even after the termination of employment. So, for example, if after the termination of employment, you need to send a demand letter or something like that to an employee, technically as for the torture, it has to be in French. There's an exception that if an employee requested that uh, the employer communicate with them in another language like English, it's fine to uh, use that other language. So as a good practice, uh, we recommend employers to ask their employees what is their preferred prefer language of communication and keep a record of that, like with their sign proof by the employee that they want to be communicated with in English, for example. Next slide. So uh, I, I spoke a bit earlier about the fact that on the job posting, if you want to require the knowledge of a language other than French, you have to explain the reason why. Um, but you cannot just decide that like that. There's a process like you uh, impose such a requirement. So prior to Bill 96, the knowledge of a language other than French could be required to obtain an employment or a position only if it was required by the nature of the duty. Uh, but the ministry, the ministry where, where of the position that it was interpreted too broadly. So now they add the uh, obligation that the employer must also take all reasonable means to avoid imposing such a requirement. And these restrictions on language requirements now apply to keeping a position as well as obtaining a position where uh, whether through recruitment, hiring, transfer, or promotion. Next slide, please. So concretely, the charter put a presumption that the employer uh, is the, the need to do an analysis uh, before imposing such requirements. Otherwise, it is deemed not to have taken all reasonable means to avoid the requirement uh, of language. So before imposing, for example, that an employee, an applicant speak English, the employer must assess the actual language needs associated with the task to be performed. They must ensure that the language skill already required of other member of staff are insufficient for the performance of this staff. And they must restrict as much as possible the number of positions to which are attached the, the task whose accomplishment requires the knowledge of a language other than French. So this means, for example, in a sales team, if you have 50% uh, of your clients only that speaks French, uh, that speak English, it wouldn't be reasonable to uh, require that all of your sales rep speak English, except if you're able to, to explain that each of them is specialized in a specific product, for example. Uh, and the charter also specified that like this requirement should not be interpreted as uh, imposing a major reorganization on the employer. Uh, it's interesting to note that the OQLF um, on their website published an information note stating that the contact with a language other than French is not enough. Relationship with stakeholder in French country is not enough in itself, and it's not enough for 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 the employer to be in a specialized sector where most interactions are in English. So you must really do the analysis on a, each uh, case basis. Next slide, please. So there are prohibition uh, against prohibited practice. I'm not going to read uh, each of them, but basically. Uh, employee will feel that uh, they are like disciplined or dismissed or subject to retaliation because uh, they speak they, they speak French. They demand uh, to be speak in French. They have uh, communicate information to the office, for example. Uh, they can file a complaint with the CNSC if they feel that they have been retaliated for that. And uh, as for unionized employee, they may file a grievance instead. Next slide, please. So uh, again, there are also protection against discrimination and harassment uh, related to the speaking of French. So uh, it might be a, a good practical tip uh, to add this in your uh, workplace harassment policy, for example, that this cannot be a ground of discrimination or harassment. Uh, 
And again, employee who believe that they are a victim of harassment or discrimination because uh, the fact that they, they, they have uh, no or little language, uh, knowledge of another language in French, they want to express themselves in French, any really reason related to the speaking of French, they may file a complaint with the CNESC uh, or uh, for the unionized employee agreements. Next slide, please. So there are sanctions for non-compliance. I'm not, again, going to go uh, in detail in, uh, on each of them, but th it, this can be fines. Uh, this can be uh, the person suffering damage uh, may uh, seek damage or may seek the nullity of the provision or the reduction of their obligation in the contract. Uh, and there may also be a revocation or a suspension of the governmental permit. Next slide, please. So just as a very quick note, uh, I mentioned earlier that all companies were subject to the obligation that I just discussed. For bigger company, company employing more than 50 people in Quebec, they also have additional obligation to ensure that the use of French is generalized at all level of the enterprise, including like within the employee, within like the uh, communication internal or external, within the work tools and documents, uh, within the public signs and poster. Uh, right now, this obligation applies to a company with 50 employees and more. Uh, but as of June 2025, it will apply to companies with uh, 25 employees or more. So uh, if you have between 25 and 50, it's a good idea to uh, start getting ready for that. Next slide, please. And just very quickly, the francization uh, of enterprise, it includes a process. So when you have six employees, 50 employees uh, for a period of six months for the first time, you now have six months to register to the office uh, with the Office of French Language, the OQLA. Then you have three, they, they would issue, issue or get a registration. Then you have to provide an analysis of linguistic situation. They look at that and they look whether the use of French is sufficiently generalized. Generally, they will find that it's not the case and there would be a process. So you have to um, impose a, a French situation program that shall be approved by the office and apply. Uh, it can be a several year program. You have to update the OQLF uh, every year. And once that your program is completed, the, the office, the OPLF will issue a certification that you are recognized as a company print uh, every, After that, every three years, you have to provide a status report to show that uh, the use of French is still generalized within the company. And if the office feel it's not the case, they may request that put a, an, ex, an action plan in place to make sure that the situation will uh, be compliant again. So that was a bit the process. And just very quickly, uh, as a last note, uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'm not going to go through uh, each of that, but for, just as a general note, company with more than 100 employees, they must have a francization company, uh, a francization committee, uh, which is a committee of employees and employers' representative, uh, and they must report to the OQLF. And next slide, please. So you will have, uh, on the last slide, you will have the, the specific responsibilities of each committee, which is basically to be included uh, in the francization process, uh, as well as being involved in participating activity aimed at informing staff of the implementation of any francization program or development in the use of French within the company. So thank you for um, listening to my presentation today. And I will now pass to my colleague, Ilan Fuan, uh, we would talk about the International Mobility Program. Thank you. Thanks, Arjan. Um, And so as it was uh, mentioned, I'll be talking to you today a little bit about the International Mobility Program, uh, what goes into hiring a temporary foreign worker under it, as well as some recent developments surrounding employers' obligations in regards to their temporary foreign workers. Um, Peggy, if we could have the first slide, please. So jumping right in, um, whenever you're dealing with a candidate or employee who's not a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, there are additional layers of complexity that are introduced by the immigration considerations. So as you can see there on the slide, Canada's immigration statutes does make it an offense to employ a foreign national in a capacity in which he or she is not authorized under this Immigration Act to be employed. 
Uh, so not to start us off on an overly grim note, but this just highlights the importance of an employer to really take the appropriate steps in employing a foreign national and be aware of its obligations under the immigration statutes. So any employer looking to hire a foreign national must first ensure that the candidate possesses the necessary work authorization to work in proposed position for the specific employer. Now, a candidate that you find may already have such authorization. Um, perhaps they hold an open work permit, which authorizes them to work for any employer in Canada in any occupation. And this would include things such as the post-graduation work permit, the open spousal work permit. Um, on the other hand, the candidate might be an international student authorized to work off campus, likely on a, on a part-time basis. In any case, there, there are limited situations where the employer might not need to be involved in obtaining work authorization. In many cases, however, um, you know, we will we'll frequently see situations where employer sets off on this arduous journey to find the perfect candidate, strikes gold, um, only to find that the candidate does not have the appropriate authorization to work. Um, an employer might have found that candidate outside of the country who does not have existing Canadian status, or they may find a candidate that's currently working in Canada, but is restricted to working for only their current employer. And in these cases, the company might contemplate supporting a work permit. Uh, Peggy, the next slide, please. So there's two overarching immigration programs for work authorization in Canada. Firstly, we have the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. And the objective of this program is to fill labor needs that can't be addressed locally, meaning by a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. Um, it's ESDC that leads this program, and it governs the application process for what's called the Labor Market Impact Assessment, or LMIA for short. Now, getting a work permit under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program involves a two-step process, which first requires employers to obtain approval from ESDC in the form of an LMIA. And if the LMIA is approved, the foreign national may then apply for a work permit based on the approved LMIA. In a nutshell, however, the, the LMIA typically involves an employer demonstrating to ESDC that there is no Canadian citizen or permanent resident that's able to fill the position or that the position falls under an occupation um, with a demonstrated labor shortage. Generally speaking, the LMIA can prove to be quite an onerous and time consuming process for employers, um, in many cases with uh, a, low, a low chance of success. Um, and on the other hand, we have the International Mobility Program. Uh, which includes a wide variety of work permit streams that are exempt from the LMIA. And unlike the, uh, the first program mentioned, it is a one-step process involving only the application for the work permit. And so given that the process is generally simpler than um, obtaining an LMIA, uh, less onerous for the employer in terms of compliance aspects, um, the IMP does tend to be the first stop considered in supporting a temporary foreign worker. Um, Peggy, can we have the next slide, please? So very quickly, what does the IMP encompass? Um, it includes the open work permit categories, which I uh, briefly mentioned earlier, but because we'll be focusing on the employer's obligations today, we'll just be talking about the closed work permits. And now most categories of work permits are administered under the International Mobility Program. Um, each of these work permit categories are based on an enumerated exemption to the LMI process, um, and each has its own distinct eligibility criteria. And so when we say LMIA exemption or a category of work permit, they are in essence the same thing and, and used interchangeably. Now, some common work permit categories that we assist employers with include the intercompany transferee, uh, which involves a transfer of a foreign national employee uh, from a company outside of Canada to a related ca entity in Canada, um, as well as some um, professional uh, work permits under international agreements or arrangements, um, such as what used to be the uh, NAFTA, now called the Canada-United States-Mexico Agreement. I'll just briefly mention here that there were new coding and category details added in December of last year. Uh, so for those of you on the call that are no strangers to um, the International Mobility Program, I just mentioned that it's still good to keep in mind that these work permit categories are organic, um, ever evolving, and there's always new guidance introduced or clarification um, of existing policies. And so it, it's important to make sure that you're up to date with the nuances of eligibility, even if you think you're very familiar with a particular category. Um, and of course, this is something our teams can guide you through. Um, next slide, please. So uh, supporting a work permit application under the IMP. 
Um, it, it's the foreign national that will submit the work permit application. However, in the case of an employer-sponsored work permit, there are certain elements that must be completed by the employer. Uh, now, this can include a supporting letter uh, from the Canadian employer providing the necessary details, as well as the evidence to prove its qualification for eligibility. Um, but in particular, what we want to talk about today is uh, for a work permit under the IMP, the employer is required to complete what's called an offer of employment filing, uh, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. Um, uh, Peggy, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so what is an offer of employment? Um, it can be a bit of a misnomer, as you might immediately think about um, the offer letter or employment contract that's already been signed, um, and any employers might uh, be under the uh, impression that this step does not apply to them. In the immigration context specifically, this refers to a very particular regulatory filing that must be completed online um, on a government platform called the Employer Portal. Now, the filing uh, through the Employer Portal collects information um, about the employer entity, the foreign worker, uh, the proposed position in terms of employment. And the employer portal is, is designed to be user friendly, but the pitfall is that it can really lure the employer into a false sense of security because uh, while the application and, and the submission might seem very straightforward and innocuous, the deta details of the offer of employment that's submitted through the employer portal, it forms the basis for the adjudication of the work permit application. Um, as well as the compliance framework that applies to employers after the work permit issuance. And so understanding the implication of the details submitted and ensuring their accuracy is really paramount to both um, the success of the work permit as well as the, the back-end protection of the employer. Uh, next slide, please. So employer compliance um, is enforced by the ESDC and the IRCC together, uh, who conduct inspections in partnership to ensure uh, that the employers that are um, using the IMP um, and the Temporary Foreign Worker Program are compliant with the terms of the offer uh, submitted through the employer portal. Um, now, most inspections are conducted randomly of any employer that's used either of the programs. Um, and they're typically conducted virtually, but in rare situations, they may include on-site on inspections. Um, they can be announced or not. Um, and in the case of targeted inspections introduced by a tip-off, uh, the inspection does tend to be a lot more invasive. I would just highlight here that employers can be chosen for an inspection uh, for up to six years after the foreign worker has first started working. Um, so regardless of whether the foreign worker has since become, let's say, a permanent resident uh, or has left the country or left the company entirely, uh, document retention, of course, is, is key for employers. Um, and they should be reviewing their global mobility and immigration compliance practices um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, next slide, please, Peggy. Um, so I'll briefly touch on the new employer obligations that were introduced um, through a series of amendments to uh, the immigration regulations. Um, these were enforced uh, back in um, September 26 of 2022. Um, and employers must now, one, make reasonable efforts to provide access to healthcare services when the temporary foreign worker is injured or becomes ill at the workplace. Two, employers should also note that they and any recruiters involved um, are prohibited from charging or recovering fees from the temporary foreign worker relating to um, the employer compliance fee uh, or any other fees uh, related to the recruitment of the foreign worker. Um, in addition, on or before the first day of work, uh, the employer is obligated to provide the foreign worker with a copy um, of the most recent information with respect to uh, temporary foreign workers' rights in Canada. Now, th this uh, particular one is in reference to a specific pamphlet that can be found on the government website. Um, in a compliance inspection, the IRCC does routinely request proof of this being provided, um, so it's important to keep a, a paper or digital trail by the employer. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, um, employers must provide an attestation uh, that the employer has entered into an employment agreement with the temporary foreign worker. Um, the employer has provided a copy of the um, employment agreement to the foreign national um, and the employer and any person who recruited the foreign national have not charged um, or recovered fees uh, from the temporary foreign worker relating to employment compliance fee or any of the other fees related to the recruitment. Um, now, this assistation uh, has been incorporated into the employer portal, which I discussed earlier, such that an employer cannot submit an offer of employment without first attesting to the above. 
Um, so it's really critical for any employer to familiarize themselves with these new obligations um, and review their hiring practices to ensure compliance. Um, and of course, our teams are here to help you navigate through those obligations um, and mitigate any risks posed to the company. So I know I've, I've kind of gone over my time here, so I'll hand it over to my colleague, Victoria, um, and she'll be speaking to you about the new pay transparency law in NBC. Over to you, Victoria. Thank you. Um, so I know my colleague Jeff did a bit of a teaser on this topic um, last week. I'm going to do a deeper dive. Uh, not a lot of time today to talk about it, but the good news for me is that there's no regulations yet for this act. So our knowledge on it is a little bit limited still, and you know, appreciate that creates some challenges for employers in terms of compliance. We're expecting this to be something where more guidance is being issued in um, the coming months. So you go to the next slide, please, Heidi. Thank you. So these obligations are already in place um, and they relate to pay history and pay secrecy or pay transparency. Um, the first obligation on employers is that you can't seek pay history um, about job applicants, pay history information. So when you're interviewing someone, it's, you know, what did you make your last job is not a question that can be asked under this legislation. Doesn't preclude employees from sharing that information with you or from you reviewing and relying on publicly available information. Um, there's also some prohibitions about employers basically taking any negative steps um, in relation to employees who have been doing certain um, things in relation to asking about their pay, disclosing information about their pay to another employer or job applicant. Um, importantly, this is information about their own pay, um, not others, <clears throat> and it's limited to other employees or people hoping to be working for the employer. Um, it also talks about uh, not taking any negative steps against employees who've uh, given information to the director of pay transparency. And I'll return to this um, theme of kind of completes this new role. Uh, Peggy, if you can move to the next slide. So this is the area I wanted to spend the most time on because these are the requirements that will be taking effect November 1st, which is next week somehow. Uh, and these relate to job posting requirements. Um, and what this requirement is, is that now employers in BC must include the expected salary um, or wage or a salary or wage range for any publicly advertised job opportunities. Um, and there was a bit more guidance published about this last week, um, which I'll go through. So in terms of what's captured by this job posting requirement, um, it's not just if you post directly as the employer, it also applies to job postings um, that are posted on your behalf, for example, by a recruiter. Um, it also captures job postings that may be up in non-BC jurisdictions, which we know online, <laughs> if the position is open to BC residents to fill. Um, what it excludes are non-public job postings, so internal job postings are captured by this, and um, what I call non-specific job postings. This would be help wanted or more general recruitment campaigns where you say, you know, we're looking for people in um, areas X, Y, and Z. In terms of what the information um, has to look like, there will be more guidance on this posted um, or coming out sometime as well. For now, it's been described as the employer's reasonable expectation of pay for the job at the time of posting. So it has to be tied to what you actually, you know, are expecting to be paying people when you post it. Um, the guidance is specific that an employee can negotiate, and of course, the employer can agree to pay more. Um, impliedly, you know, that means that um, there should not be situations where something posted where you're then paying less for the role. Um, it doesn't have to include anything other than the actual wage or salary. So overtime benefits, anything gratuitous or extra doesn't need to be listed. Um, and if it's a range, it can't include an unspecified minimum or maximum. So an example of that would be up to $50,000 isn't compliant. It would have to say, you know, thirty dollars to $50,000, for example. Um, and interestingly, there's no restriction on the size of range that can be posted. However, that's something that then the government has claimed they might impose. Um, but for now, it's not restricted. So the range can be 10,000 to 70,000, um, 50,000 to 100,000, for example. Uh, if we can move over to the next slide. So reporting requirements, um, 
it's a bit premature, I think, for most employers to be getting too, too much or too worried about this area. And I say that because the government has been very clear that they're going to be posting a lot more guidance about this in the new year after this first round of employers for all government employers and then the major crown corporations have gone through the reporting process. So things like there will be an online reporting tool that's going to roll out. Um, the government's actually specifically said for reporting employers next year, they'll give them a chance to provide feedback. Um, so there'll be much more detailed guidance about what these reports need to look like um, in the coming months. One of the frequently asked questions on this area we've gotten is when it says, you know, the reporting's introduced yeah. in stages and lists by size, is that 1,000 employees um, as a total workforce or is that 1,000 employees in BC? There isn't a 100% guaranteed answer to this, um, but our interpretation, and we've got sort of unofficial confirmation that that's gonna be BC employees. So, you know, 1,000 employees in BC, um, but, as I said, that's not completely confirmed. So we'll, of course, be monitoring um, and provide confirmation of that as soon as we're able to. Um, for now, uh, one thing that employers could look at is BC government's gender and sex data standard. I haven't linked it in the slides, but it is linked on a recent blog post, which also goes through this uh, in quite a bit of detail as well, if this is an area you want more information on. That's just going to be informing what sort of information goes into those reports. So it might be helpful to start wrapping your heads around what these are going to um, look like. The reports will be published, but they're not going to list necessarily um, specific wage information. The focus is more on you know, gaps, um, of course, and, and like a pay equity approach. And if we can go to the next slide. So enforcement, of course, a big question. So the act does create this new role of director of pay transparency and the responsibilities of this director are going to include supporting employers in complying with pay transparency obligations. That would be consultation, education, et cetera. Uh, it contemplates that they'll receive reports of non-compliance by employers um, from employees likely. Uh, and then there will be more prescribed responsibilities which haven't come out yet. So the anticipation is that the enforcement regime for this, which but currently um, is not really a specific one, will be driven by employee complaints to the Director of Pay Transparency, who will, under the regulations, have some ability to deal with those. Um, the other enforcement piece to flag is, of course, BC Human Rights Code. This isn't new. Um, employees have always been able to make complaints about um, discrimination in wages. Um, but it is interesting that the government actually specifically directs employees there. And of course, the, the Human Rights Tribunal isn't going to be enforcing the pay transparency or job posting requirements. Um, and the Act does specifically confirm that the Offense Act does not apply. Um, so that will not be um, something that the Act can be enforced under. We'll do the final slide. Um, so just briefly, um, there's a review scheduled. This first obligation here is for the government, and so just a point of interest. And then in terms of what's coming next, like I said, the regulations we are expecting there to be lots more details on reporting requirements, potentially some more detail on the posting, the job posting requirements. Um, and what we'll be monitoring very carefully, of course, is what the director of pay transparency is going to be able to do in, in terms of enforcing compliance. And I will leave it there and introduce my wonderful colleague, Larissa. Thank you very much, Victoria. And so Bringing up the, the end of this webinar, uh, I wanted to take some time to address the upcoming changes to the Canada Labour Code that are going to impact the federally regulated employers that are listening to this webinar. But provincially regulated employers, please don't drop off because we do still have the, the Q&A to come at the end. If we turn to the next slide, when explaining what is changing when it comes to legislation, I always find it's very helpful to start with what is the current landscape so you can do that compare and contrast. And as you can see from the slide, the current federal landscape is really divided between two groups of employees. You have those employees that have the unjust dismissal protections applied to them and those that don't, simple as that. And so when we're talking about that unjust dismissal scheme or protection, what I'm referring to is that, that protection that employees have from being dismissed without there being a, a reason for their dismissal. And this scheme that's codified in the Canada Labour Code, it replaces that common law ability of employers to dismiss an employee 
on a without cause basis by simply providing reasonable notice of termination. And so instead, in the federal context, if the employer doesn't have a just reason for why the employment relationship is coming to an end, an employee can engage this unjust dismissal scheme, make a complaint, uh, and potentially be entitled to significant remedies, including reinstatement, uh, back pay, uh, and more. But there are exceptions to this scheme. And those exceptions you can see are listed on the screen. Uh, so this includes employees that have less than 12 months of continuous employment, managerial employees, uh, employees who have been laid off or dismissed because of a discontinuance of work or uh, a lack of work, rather, a discontinuance of a function, uh, or then employees who have a different mechanism through which they can uh, dispute the end of their employment, the most obvious and common example being uh, unionized employees who have recourse through a collective agreement. And it's these exemptions that I'm actually focusing on for the rest of this presentation, because that's where the new amendments that are coming into effect are going to be uh, interacting with the current entitlements. So if, if we move to the next slide, those employees that don't have the unjust dismissal protection, they don't fall within that scheme, uh, they are entitled to what you can see are the three different entitlements under the uh, under the Kendall Labor Code. So you have individual notice of termination, uh, severance pay, and then there's the group notice of termination entitlements that, that apply as well. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about these three because uh, I'm mindful of the time. And I would also hope most uh, federally regulated employers listening are aware already of what these different entitlements are. But what I want to focus on is that first bullet, which is that individual notice of termination entitlement. And so currently, under the Canada Labor Code, employees who have completed uh, three or more months of continuous employment, they are entitled to two weeks of notice or pay in lieu of notice, unless the employer has, has just cause to terminate the employment relationship. And so in terms of what's changing, if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is that the Canada Labour Code is being amended to increase those individual notice of termination entitlements. And specifically, as you can tell from the chart, a graduated entitlement scheme is being introduced. And the idea behind that, and this has been published uh, by the Government of Canada as, as part of what came out of the consultation leading to these amendments, is the government is looking to align the individual notice of termination entitlement set out in the code with what you see in, in a majority, uh, if not all, of the provincial and territorial termination schemes across Canada, where there's this idea that as you get more uh, service with an employer, you get an enhanced uh, or increased entitlement to notice uh, related. And so the chart sets out those increased entitlements that will be coming into effect. The main thing that I will flag uh, for the listeners uh, of this webinar is that, as you can see, the entitlement to three weeks of notice of termination, that's not triggered until an employee has three completed years of, of service with an employer. And so what that means is practically speaking, these amendments are only going to have an impact on any employees that have been employed with you for three years or, or more. For anyone that's under that threshold, the regular rules uh, are still going to continue to apply. Turning to the next slide, concurrent with this change to the actual notice that employees are entitled to under the Canada Labor Code, the federal uh, government is also introducing uh, an amendment where employers are going to be required to provide employees with a statement uh, at the end of their employment relationship. Now, this statement requirement, it's not an entirely novel one, uh, as in the group termination context, this actually has already been a requirement that employers have had to provide. And so what is happening instead is the federal government has said, well, let's just equalize this right and entitlement. Let's make it that all employees now at the end of their employment will get a statement uh, confirming what it is that their uh, entitlements were. And in particular, the statement has to address their vacation benefits, their wages, uh, the severance pay that's owing to them, and any other benefits or pay arising out of that employment relationship. There are different deadlines for when this statement is going to have to be provided, and that depends on how the employment relationship is coming to an end. And you can see that from the last three bullets on the screen. So if the employment relationship 
is ending through a working notice period, uh, then the statement must be provided no later than two weeks before the end of, of the employment relationship. If you're giving pay in lieu of notice, then the statement has to be given on the day that that, pay in, that notice is being given. And then if there's a combination of working notice or pay in lieu, uh, then you either have to give it two weeks before the termination date, or if the working notice period is less than that two week period on the day on which the employee is receiving that notice. Turning to the next slide. So what do employers need to know about these amendments? And what I think is helpful is actually what I've summarized on the slide, which is what is not changing right now. I've, I've emphasized that it's really the individual notice of termination entitlements that are impacted by this. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of the other different parts of the termination landscape in the federal uh, legislation, they're staying the same. Uh, and so, as I've already mentioned, for employees with less than three years of service, there's there's no impact, there's no change on the entitlements they would get at termination. Similarly, uh, the statutory severance scheme and entitlements, those are remaining the same. Uh, there's been no impact to that. Neither has that unjust dismissal scheme as a whole been changed. And so really, when we're talking about these amendments, it's impacting those scenarios or those circumstances where someone doesn't have recourse to the unjust dismissal scheme, and instead uh, their employment relationship can be ended through the individual notice being provided. Uh, and finally, there's no change to the group termination entitlements. I, I will note there are amendments pending to the group termination provisions. They're not significant or substantive, but they are. Uh, they were captured in the Budget Implementation Act that uh, also introduced these amendments. But no coming into force date has yet been proclaimed uh, for these amendments. And it's unclear at this time whether or not the federal government is going to be introducing and bringing those changes into force in advance of February 1st, the date on which these amendments take effect. Uh, but given that currently the group termination provisions do refer back to the individual notice of termination provision in the Canada Labour Code, it's possible that we'll see that change in that group. And we will update everyone as, as soon as we know that. So these changes come into effect on February 1st, 2024. And before they come into effect, we strongly recommend that federally regulated employers take a look at their current employment contracts and make sure that the language that they have uh, complies with this new scheme that is being introduced. In particular, for example, if the current version of your termination provision references that two week entitlement only, uh, then you will have an issue in being contravention of the code if that is the language that's still being used after uh, this enhanced graduated scheme comes into effect. And of course, if you ever need any help with reviewing or revising your uh, termination provisions, and this is the true for any employer, regardless of federal or provincial, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to your regular employment lawyer here at Denton's, and we'd always be very happy to help you with that. And so with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Allison so we can get on with the Q&A. Thanks, Larissa. Thanks, everybody. That was really, really informative. And, uh, and we have lots of questions that came in through the chat. So um, let's get uh, to some of those. Um, Ariane was very helpful in um, answering some of these questions privately, but um, there were a number of questions that came through for Ariane's presentation. So I think responding to one or two um, publicly would be really helpful. So Ariane, can you um, tell us about what, what the requirements are for an inter internal newsletter directed to employees that contains external links? Um, yeah. What's the extent of the French language translation required with that? Absolutely. So obviously, if you uh, include external links leading to external content in the sense that this is not the company content, like you refer to a, a news article, newspaper, for example, obviously you do not have to translate that. However, I want to be clear that if you refer, if the external link refers to the company's content, for example, your own web page, then uh, it has to be translated because anything that you put on your web page, for example, on, on your website on, or on an internet um, page is generally considered as communication to the employees as well. Terrific. Okay. And 
Are federally regulated employers doing business in Quebec subject to the Charter of French Language? Um, no, actually. Um, at the beginning, it was the position of the government of, the Quebec, of Quebec that they would be. Uh, however, they reached an agreement with the federal government where the federal government adopted a very similar uh, law that would apply to um, federal companies doing business in Quebec and also in country in, in part of the country where um the, there are French 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 speaking uh, group. Um so they are not subject to the charter but they are subject to very similar requirements as per the federal law. Terrific. Thank you. Um, now Helen, we have a number of questions come in for you. For the IMP program specifically is the employment opportunity requirement for full year, full time year round, or could you apply for seasonal employees as well? Um, thanks, Allison. It's a good question. Um, again, the IMP program is uh, it, it encompasses a large number of different work permit categories, and so every every um, you know every application will have to be considered on a case by case um, basis. Generally speaking, however, um, there's usually no particular requirement um, of the employer to provide um, any particular duration of employment. One thing I'll 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 say to kind of zoom out and and give context to this is that work permits are are permissive documents, right? Where a foreign national normally um, who's in Canada, they're not a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. They're not typically um, permitted to conduct work um, work activities in Canada. The work permit is the authorizing document that allows this foreign national to complete, um, you know, certain activities under very uh, specific terms and conditions. So if an employer is seeking, um, you know, work authorization for a single season for an employee or uh, a particular limited duration, um, this is certainly something the employer can um, can typically use. But again, um, this will be very different for every work permit category um, contemplated. And so we we'll need to look at this on a case by case basis. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, and I know this one is a little bit loaded, but um, in the recruiting process, can you reject a candidate if they don't hold a work permit? Uh, that's a good question. And again, I think this this has a big intersection with um, employment law as well. And so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of leave room for some of my colleagues to, to chime in as well. Um, but to my understanding, and the um, the real prohibition is against discriminating against um you know, any candidates uh, that are seeking opportunities based on um, their citizenship. Um, in the recruitment process, I believe you can um, ask a question whether uh, they are um, legally authorized to work uh, in Canada. Um, but again, it's 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 very important to toe that very fine line of where, um, you know, you are discriminating against a candidate versus not. Um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll let, my, uh, let my colleagues chime in from the employment team if there's anything else to add there. I think that's a big question. Well, uh, unless Larissa wants to jump in, I'm sure this should go on for a little while. So Larissa, do you have a say, comment on that? It, it can go on for a long time, but I've, I've worked with Elon and John on this issue before, which is why I can chime in. Uh, it, that's effectively right. So there's this uh, under the Human Rights Code in Ontario, citizenship is a protected ground. It's one of the more unique ones to Ontario. Um, but that's really where some of that concern is coming from, is whether you're going to be violating that protection of freedom from discrimination on the, on the ground of citizenship. Uh, what constitutes citizenship and where in that process of becoming sort of a resident of Canada that gets triggered uh, is, is a bit of a live question. There's case law on multiple different sides of that of that coin. Uh, so if you have any specific questions, uh, best to reach out to uh, your regular gentleman's uh, colleague who can then uh, give you that information. Thanks, Clarissa. While I have you, um, a question did come in from your presentation as well. Practically speaking, how big of an impact will these amendments have on federally regulated employers? Uh, <laughs> As I as I mentioned, or at least gotten around, not a huge impact is really going to impact those circumstances where you can be engaging in that individual termination and those unjust dismissal protections don't apply. And I, I'd seen a couple other questions around sort of what does this mean that termination can only be for cause? It, not necessarily for just cause only in the sense of, of how the common law has defined it, but certainly that idea that there has to be a reason or a cause for, uh, for why you are 
ending the employment relationship. And so there's those exceptions that I had reviewed, managerial employees, employees with less than 12 months of service, and that discontinuance uh, of a function or lack of work. But other than that, the, you know, the unjust dismissal protections are quite broad under the Canada Labor Code. The intention was to create for non-unionized employees a scheme that is effectively mirroring the protections that a collective agreement affords unionized employees. And so this is going to have just a small impact uh, and not impact the larger scheme that exists. Perfect, thank you. And I know we're running short on time, but Victoria, there was a question that came up in a number of different ways in the chat. Um, and it all sort of boils down to if a position is posted externally and anyone can apply, including BC residents, do we need to include the wages? So I think the technical answer to that based on the government guidance, which I know is not actually in the legislation yet, it's posted um, by the ministry responsible for this. The exact language is that it does apply to jobs advertised in other jurisdictions or anywhere if the position's open to BC residents and may ever be filled by someone living in BC. And it actually even specifies either in-person or remotely for that requirement. So currently, uh, and we'll see again what the regulations actually say about this, the act's not super clear about the scope of its application or this requirement, but currently, uh, I think the answer to that would be yes. If it's something that can be filled by an employee who's living in BC, the expectation would be job posting. Um, but I did wanna clarify as well that for federally regulated employers, you're not technically falling within the scope of this Pay Transparency Act um, at this time and the, and the federal version of its own legislation. So um, just a quick clarification on that as well. Perfect, thanks, Victoria. Um, and I see that we're getting up to time here. So I want to thank all of our speakers and our attendees. We really hope that you found this session valuable. Um, and this presentation will be distributed with relevant materials in our post-event email. Our next webinar series will take place on Friday, November 24th, and will be our last of the se session of the year. And the invitation will be shared in the coming weeks. Thanks, everyone, again, and have a great weekend.